Hi, Veronica. Um, just a question for our U European uh, comrades. Uh-huh. Uh, um, they like you, they follow you, and they uh, <laughs> would like to, to know what you think about all, all, uh, all this conflict and uh, during the period you stay, you are staying here. Mm -hmm. Um, what pushed you to come to come here? I can see uh, you are too dedicated to this issue. Uh, is there anything anything special, anything spiritual in in, in your case? Um, no, not so much a spiritual idea, but certainly an idea that that there's a cause here that is a cause that's worth um, taking a strong position and a stand and being involved and participating and making my own contribution to uh, to that which is of course the cause of a journalist here in a situation where much of the coverage from western journalists has been myopic and one-sided then there's a cause to um, to come and deliver the real story, the truth, the real story, the real reporting of, uh, of what's really happening so it's not really religious or it's not really spiritual but it's, it's probably something that's quite personal, quite intrinsic and a sense of a calling, a sense of perhaps even uh, duty. So, uh, yeah. okay. About uh, you were telling me that it was connected also to your choice of your life, that uh, you were thinking about to do something important. Well, you always have an idea. I think in your life, you know, when you know you're growing up and uh, and whatnot. Then you always have an idea of what will your life be. You know, what is it going to be? And you know, you have. Um, thoughts and I suppose in my case you know I'd had thoughts I'd wanted to do things earlier in my life I've tried a few things um, I'd done a few things I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do when I was young when I was at university I performed stand-up comedy even for a couple of years when I was a, when I was a student I wrote a play for the Edinburgh Fringe and then always had an idea that I'd like to be a journalist but then lived in London and lived quite a normal life in London worked for the government and didn't really engage in that side of things. It just wasn't um, something that really arose an opportunity to do that, to be a journalist or to get involved with something in London. I just never really, it never really came to, to that. I lived quite a standard life for almost 10 years in London. Went to an office, worked, liked to travel, um, enjoyed traveling. So then I found Ukraine in 2009 through following the England football team and um, decided that it would be an interesting place to live to sort of restart at that time I was 31 to sort of reboot my life, sort of restart, be a journalist, there were opportunities for journalism in Ukraine at that time there was a magazine in Kiev, English language magazine, What's On, uh, there was um, Kiev Post, the TV channel and it was also before Euro 2012 so there were real opportunities to um, do something so I wanted to do something different, I wanted to kind of reboot my life and um, you know, so I worked since uh, a journalist in Kiev for a year at a magazine, TV channels, quite a standard journalist, wrote a lot of columns, articles, pieces for TV, it was quite standard stuff. And um, then I made the choice, because I enjoyed studying uh, Russian, that I'd like to live in Odessa, because I really love Odessa. Um, so I went down to live in Odessa, bought a flat there, uh, was studying Russian, taking Russian lessons, uh, was working as a journalist, but there was less work as a journalist there, of course, so... I was also working as, a, as an English teacher and you know, had quite a nice life in Odessa. I would drive around in my car and take photos, wrote a blog at that time. Um, and I was thinking, I don't know, is maybe this going to be it? Because already then I was in my mid-30s, so 34 at that time. So I was thinking that perhaps this is this is it. You know, Perhaps I'll live in Odessa and just be a teacher and, and a journalist and a blogger. And I thought... I guess that would have been okay at the time. I wasn't sort of strongly feeling the need to to go and throw myself into a cause. It wasn't like sort of Byron or kind of Hemingway or anything like that. That I felt I needed to go and travel and get involved in a cause uh, anywhere. I was more um, in a desk, you know, do my own thing. I would write quite a lot for the blog um, and taking photos. And I started taking videos. And then I went to my Dan in January of 2014, and um, I remember just feeling there something really wrong and feeling there that there was a story that wasn't being told that wasn't being shown so I took some video in my Dan on my Dan and then after that I started being more active I traveled all around the east of Ukraine as it was before it's now of course Novorossiya um, taking photos interviewing people I was doing a lot more video at that time 
interviewing people in the street, doing videos. This was March. Um, then also went to Crimea uh, in March for the referendum. Was doing filming in Odessa. And then things started in Odessa. So then it's your and my dad passed it, passed in Kiev. And I went to my dad and I filmed on it a few times. But um, I wasn't there, you know, constantly in my dad because I was living in Kiev at that time. And of course, as a journalist, there was fewer opportunities for someone who didn't support my dad. It seemed like the whole Western world was supporting my dad and I wasn't. And so um, that was one that I kind of watched and then it came and it hit Odessa uh, and then things started up in Odessa in um, in March. And I was following, I was covering uh, reporting events as a journalist and then got an offer from RT to come and uh, work in Donetsk for a week. Uh, and then when the week was up, I decided, you know, I kind of demanded to uh, stay. And um, and that's it. I'm still here. You know, it'll soon be uh, a year. I've been, of course, I've been deported a couple of times and whatnot. So I think it was a case of, of realising when this started that this was my thing in life, that something had come along um, that was, that was going to be a calling, a sense of duty, and that it came to me... Um, as I say in my mid-thirties that I had wondered what life was going to be what I was going to do with my life and this came along it was a sense of this is it this is this is my time uh, this is this is something that I have to be involved in and something that I have to make the most of make the absolute most of so I mean it's been of course it's not been easy a lot of times I mean like I say I've been in captivity twice from the Ukrainian side deported twice had things taken from me I've you know, along the way there've been, of course, some barriers. But I've always, I've always known that I have to. Obviously, my family are really, a lot of times, they support me. Of course, the work that I'm doing here. But of course, they're really worried. They would love me to be back in uh, England. They message me all the time. Mum wants me to be home, and uh, is really worried about me all the time. And uh, dad also. So you know, of course, there's these things that I miss my parents. You know, I miss my family um, and uh, and whatnot. I miss my country. But you know, I also know that. There's something that I have to do here, and um, and that's a, a determined sort of duty to fulfil. And uh, and of course, obviously, been injured as well, took a shrapnel wound to the back. Um, but you know, I've known that this is my, this is my time. This is my um, thing to to do to make a life's work out of, and that the work that I've done, the work that I'm doing, is something that will be. Um, there's something that will have resonance, something that will be significant in my life for all my life, and um, and that's something that I think inspires and sort of drives you on. So you never give up because you know that this is it, that this is your. Because you wonder if you're maybe in your you know mid thirties as I was, and nothing's really come up. You wonder, I don't know, is your life going to be sort of pedestrian or mundane, or and then this comes up, and and I wouldn't have wanted it to be like that. You know, I wouldn't have ever wanted you know to see the things that I've seen, the amount of dead people and things I've seen I would never have wanted that to happen but I also always felt that this is this is my time to make a sworn uh, duty and uh, and a solemn uh, commitment and stick with it and I've been really supported by the people here just the ordinary people of Donbass people in Russia have supported me without that it would have really been impossible to continue because there's things like you know, it's obviously difficult to even get money here and people have sent things through and helped me and supported me um, and so thanks to them I feel a, a sense of being together of partnership uh, and also a sense that that you know I want to I want to you know these people who believed in me who've supported me I want to do the best for them the best that I can the best possible for them and the best for the people here in Dubai so you know when it's over when things have um, come to a situation that it isn't a war here which we all hope is is going to happen as soon as possible I'll be happy to return to civilian life and film things when I had interest before in Ukraine I was interested in abandoned buildings I did quite a lot of writing and filming of abandoned buildings but I'll be really interested to film a reconstruction rebuilding and um, something I'm really looking forward to in the future mm -hmm. uh, so um, do you think how do you th how long do you think this conflict will go on and when will start to rebuild <laughs> well, here yeah, it's, a for it's, a, it's unfortunate that it's a conflict without a conclusion, seemingly, because it's unlike Crimea, which is determined territory. There's no defined determined territory, so it's very complicated now that you um, you do have situations of, if in Ukraine, a country that's just 
a country that's just collapsed. If you go to Slovyansk, for example, they had a referendum and um, voted to be a part of uh, the Donetsk People's Republic. Um, but you know now in Slovyansk, obviously there have been people um, who have been kind of placed there by the Ukrainian government from the west to sort of Ukrainianize the city. So there are pro-Ukraine people there, activists there, um, and there's a lot of people living in fear. Everyone's unhappy. You know, the pro-Ukraine side are unhappy um, because they've really got nothing. I mean, you know, everything's collapsed in Ukraine. The Grievna, the industry, the economy. Uh, and then on the other side, these people are very unhappy because they don't want to be a part of Ukraine. They voted out of it and Ukraine sent in an army to basically to basically attack them. So on both sides, uh, I mean, at the moment, at least where we are in Donbass, um, people who are here who voted, who took part in the referendum and voted to secede, um, they do have that, uh, but it's obviously at the moment it's war conditions. I mean, it's extremely tough to think of rebuilding, think of the amount of rebuilding that will need to be done to infrastructure, airports, uh, homes, and then the idea of rebuilding people's minds to get them back to living a normal life, to understand that, that you know, seeing bodies and blood, it's not normal. People have got so used to seeing these things, they've, they've become so accustomed that you have to almost... Um, kind of come back to a sense of of normal life of what it is and, and what it signifies in terms of um, what we delineate and, uh, and what we define as being as being acceptable parameters, which are that you know we need a law um, in operation, we need um, a system, a structure, and also for people to retune and to um, return to if you like to living a life by the principles which are that um that you know a death any death is a tragedy seeing uh, people killed isn't normal these children have seen terrible things people that are queuing for breads it'll take a time to rebuild the structure but it'll take a time to rebuild people's minds who've really um uh, who've really been living under situations that it's almost when you film videos and, and you put it out and see the response people are just shocked at how bad it is uh, people living in cellars, they've been living in cellars for months without, um, in many cases, enough food, water. Um, I mean, it's just so extreme when you come to someone like Pyrrha Maisk to see how people are living. It shocks It shocks people. Um, I think it's an important story to tell. I genuinely believe that, that, you know, if you show stories, if you put the stories out there, then that can help a situation, it can motivate people.